Welcome, everybody, to Let's Talk Computer Science, a podcast dedicated to talking about the past, present, and future of computer science. This podcast is made possible by our friends at Rex Academy. Be sure to check out their amazing computer science platform, including courses on cybersecurity, app development, and, of course, everybody's favorite, artificial intelligence. If you don't have a teacher, not a problem. Rex is now providing instructors as part of the platform, so be sure to check them out at rex.academy. Now, today on the show, I'm excited. We get computer science teachers. We get people in the classroom. Now we have a former superintendent. Dwight Jones is a former school superintendent of some of the largest districts in the country. I think Clark County, Denver, you may have heard of these. Uh, He works with a company called IEI, which I know very well. Doug Roberts organization, very well-run organization. He's worked with several education companies over his past, including McGraw-Hill and Discovery, just to name a few. Welcome to the podcast, Dwight. Well, thank you very much, Carl. It's great to be with you uh, this morning or afternoon, depending on where you are. (laughs) <laughs> yeah, depending on where you are in the country. And that's the great thing about technology, right? It could bridge all gaps, bridge all hours. Um, so speaking of technology, give me a little bit of your backstory. What, what, like, what got you involved? First of all, I guess somewhat in education, but then also was there a light bulb moment where you saw technology and education kind of coming together to be something that's powerful for kids? Yeah, I appreciate that opportunity to share. And uh, folks that know me across the country will say, Dwight Jones and technology, ah, that just doesn't mix. Because, <laughs> you know, I grew up in Western Kansas and grew up on a farm and in the school that I attended you know, technology just wasn't part of the conversation. And a matter of fact, at that time, it really wasn't even part of the conversation as far as a potential job in the future. So, you know, I really kind of had that light bulb, bulb go on is when I served as the state commissioner for Colorado. You know, what I found immediately was the job market and the high paying jobs and uh, what was so available in Colorado, you know, in you know, whether the space industry or the airline, and they were building a brand new airport, and there were so many technology jobs. And as I would speak with the legislature and with the governor's office, they were always struggling with so many of the folks that are doing these jobs are recruited from other states. What are we going to do to make sure our students are better positioned for these high paying jobs right here in this state, which is a pretty high performing state, And yet we just was not positioned well. So I said, we've got to do a lot in a short amount of time. And so there was an industry push, but there also was a push within the school system and the higher ed institution because it was kind of the Colorado paradox. You know, everybody was saying, we want to make sure these jobs are available to students right here in the state. Yet the majority of the jobs are filled by students that are coming from outside the state. So that's when Carl, I really said as commissioner and as the educational lead in the state, we've got to, you know, we've got to not only pick up the pace, but we've got to figure this out in short amount of time. Yeah. I think that was uh, there's a lot of light bulb moments for superintendents and leaderships at different States. Like you said, uh, not only are we pulling talent sometimes from out of state, we're also pulling it from out of country. And I know yeah. that like CS jobs in particular, there's been a trend where we seem to be feeling this more and more with people of international. Not, and not that there's anything wrong with having a little bit of global diversity, but you know, we should try to keep those as much as we can with our students. Um, I think part of this goes to leadership. And I know you work a lot with leadership and kind of the importance of where computer science fits on the pecking order in schools. Because you know, whether we like it or not, since the 1940s and 50s, basically it's been English, it's been uh, math, social studies, and science, and that's it. You know, we're going to throw most of our energy and attention to those, possibly because of standardized testing, more than likely. Um, but why, why, so why do you think that's the case? I guess standardized testing might be one of it, one of the reasons. Why is it the case that we still focus on those and that computer science is kind of an afterthought? And then what should we, and then my second part of that question is, how would you encourage leaders to kind of change that paradigm? Yeah, I I appreciate the um, kind of two-part question, Carl, and I think it's right on. I think that is the right question. And, you know, again, I keep pointing, you know, as you point the finger outward, there's usually three or four fingers pointing back at you. And so I always start with me first, you know, kind of the old Michael Jackson man in the mirror, you know, start with yourself first. And, you know, I'm pretty old school. And, you know, old school also in my education thinking, not that I don't think reading, writing, and math is not still important. But I think the over-focus by leaders like myself that says, you know, we, we've got to almost make sure that that is always the top priority. I still think it's a major priority, but what's happened is so many things have changed. 
And yeah. technology can do so much more that I just think we've really missed the boat of actually saying, you know, reading, writing, math, social studies are still critical and will always be critical. But what gets added to that and how are we as educational leaders making sure that our students are getting that well-rounded education that prepares them, you know, for the job market. And in many cases, you know, experts still say it's the jobs that haven't even been invented yet that our students have to be prepared to fill. So I just think, you know, uh, some of us old school educators have just <laughs> got to get with the times and we've got to pay attention to what our young people are telling us and as well as what the job market is telling us. So how we fix it, I think, is a lot of things that are going on right now. Uh, you know, I work as a senior advisor with IEI, which is innovative superintendents that come together to solve problems all the time. I work as a senior advisor with Whiteboard, and Whiteboard is really kind of an amazing think tank that works at the legislative level and really supports kind of these kind of concepts. And then, you know, I'm beneficial that I've learned a lot from just interacting with the experts at Rex Academy. You know, Rex Academy is an amazing piece because not only do they help you figure out how you position yourself for computer science, they'll even provide the instructor. And right. there is uh, Dr. Daryl Bonds is the high school principal at Falcon High School right here outside of Colorado Springs where I live. And he partnered with Rex Academy and I got to go visit the school and I was blown away by just they had an online instructor and the students were so engaged and were learning. And, you know, they had a paraeducator that was also part of the classroom. And I just said, wow, I wouldn't even have thought two or three years ago that that concept would even be a reality. And now not only is it a reality, I was seeing it being demonstrated and the kids were so engaged and learning and could talk about their progress. So there's kind of no excuse now for schools yeah. and districts not to say computer science matters. We know that the future, whether it's on cybersecurity, whether it's on, even on gaming, you know, so many students interact. I never, I've never really played with games. I'm not very good at it. So I just never, <laughs> say, boy, do I have some sons that are really good at it. So I just think we have to do a better job and the obstacles have been removed by amazing companies like Rex Academy that are just partnering with school districts to make it happen. Yeah, that that uh, eye opening moment. And I think it's a combination of many things. Um, you know, the pandemic definitely forced us to figure out online learning. And I think that and it also made us rethink and rephrase kind of reframe kind of our set of what we think teaching and learning should always look like. You know, back in the day, we'd imagine people to close their eyes and say what the classroom looked like. And he's like, all right, well, you've got a, you know, you've got four walls and you've got a teacher standing at the front and there's 20 some odd kids and desks, you know, but now I think if you ask kids coming up, it could be anything. And like you were saying, being able to see kids interact and show progress in their projects, um, that's, that's where I think it's all about they, that excitement and that engagement, getting them pulled in and then having that kind of expert to kind of hold, help them through that process and facilitate it. And back to the gaming point you made. Yeah, that's another one. I mean, I have three girls and uh, I would say that all of them like games at some point, the youngest two, especially, but I, my middle one, I'm pretty sure she's going to be like on an esports team, which again, five, six years ago, who would have ever thought, you know, esports? now you get scholarships. They, I think there's like over 200 colleges giving scholarships or something. So what, what do you think about esports? If you're, you know, all that. Yeah. I, I, I would not be surprised that there aren't scholarships there. And, and, you know, even in robotics, you know, what yeah. I really appreciate about Colorado, that was kind of an early win. And it was a win that districts could easily kind of stand up. You know, let's put together a robotics team. Now the competition and the challenges associated with robotics has just gone off the charts. And so the push is there. And then, you know, also making sure that you talk about your three daughters, making sure that we get more girls and more students of color into this industry and computer science. And I think districts and schools have to really make an effort to do that because that's not always immediately uh, viable, I think, to either girls or sometimes students of color. And so I think there has to be a concentrated effort to help make that happen. And what we're finding is that when either girls or, or students of color get in, it's no different than everyone else. They like it. They're engaged. It's pretty exciting. And I think it just opens up a whole window of opportunities that maybe they haven't even thought about. And there are a lot of scholarships and opportunities at colleges and institutions, but also, you know, 
that a lot of companies will say, you don't even have to go that route. Just get a certification or just come join us and just have that skill set and we'll develop what you need to know and be able to do to be very successful. So, you know, whether Harley Davidson or or even all these, you know, electric, uh, you know, this new electric cars that are just uh, kind of just blowing up or, or even the new energy, you know, field, there are so many opportunities and folks are just looking for students to fill those jobs and they really want to do it right here in the States. But to your point earlier, Carl, many times they're happen to recruit students from outside the country. Yeah. Uh, funny you mentioned Harley Davidson. I believe the founder and CEO of Rex Academy used to work for Harley Davidson, Sandy, <laughs> who hosted this podcast before me. But yeah, um, yeah, there's a lot. And, and I, I know you do a lot of work on equity inclusion. So I'm glad you mentioned those points about, you know, underserved people of color and, and, and girls in, in general seem to not have the same opportunities as someone who looks like me when it comes to computer science. Well, what are the reasons behind that mostly? You know, why is that? Why is that happening? And, and what age is it just kind of across the board? Or do you feel like are certain kids, like girls in particular, I know there's some studies that say they kind of drop out of that interest in middle school, maybe because they think it's just, well, it's a thing for boys. Um, and then, of course, and then kids that are in underserved communities, maybe they just don't have the access. But what are, what are those reasons and how do we overcome it? I think it's probably the more important one. Yeah, I, I think the biggest thing that we do to overcome it is just making sure that people and young people know what's out there and what's available. I, I liken it a little bit to, you know, there was a reason why they felt like they had to have Title IX in athletics yeah. and sports. And, you know, it was so male dominated. And now I don't know if you've ever seen a WNBA basketball game. I mean, the stands are full. The It's amazing the women and girls and how they're playing this sport and the interest that it has just created. And and I think that effort and making sure what's aware and then just kind of leveling the playing field to make sure that that opportunity is presented has a tremendous impact. And I, I think there are some lessons there for us around, you know, computer sciences. Let's just make sure folks are aware. Programs really ought to get started in elementary school because what happens as folks start looking at what do I want to do or what comes next, that really starts getting developed in elementary school, gets a little more. Um, I think um, solidified in middle school and then in high school, they start to take a program, you know, that matches kind of where that interest is or what I think I want to do. Now, what we know is folks change their mind and think about a lot of things, but getting exposed, having the opportunity, having role models that are in those different positions. You know, Sandy from Rex Academy, uh, folks haven't met her in person. She's amazing. I mean, she is, story yeah. is amazing. But just that energy that she brings to it is just so exciting and so engaging. I said, if you meet with Sandy, you're probably going to say, wow, I've got to figure out more about computer science. And we've got to figure out how we're going to make this happen in our district, in our school, in our classroom. Doesn't matter if it's rural, suburban or urban. You know, computer science, I think we've got to figure out how we make sure it's available to all for all. And I think that's her mission, and that's the mission of Rex Academy, uh, which which is why I've always been interested in them as a company too. I like that you pointed out that I think a lot of people listen and they think computer science, and they immediately gravitate toward high school. Like, well, that's where we got to focus all of our energy, and, and definitely there should be some there. But I think uh, what you're saying makes so much more sense. It's like you got to give them some level of exposure, and if they don't have the ability to do it or the teacher that's willing to try it, you know, these kids are pretty fearless with the technology. It's more about how do we set them kind of tasks and goals and projects to get them going. I think, you know, Rex provides a lot of that at the elementary level. Um, and I know there's a lot of free that's out there too. Code.org is out there putting things out now too. Rex is a little more structured. I think code is more like, uh, you know, we want the hour of code for that for December. Um, so I like that kind of building it out and giving them that, that long kind of form exposure and then maybe seeing what happens as they go through middle school or high school. Yeah, um, Carl, I, I, would, I'm, I don't want to interrupt you, but I would yeah, yeah. add, you know, in my former district where I was superintendent in Las Vegas, you know, Clark County School District, which is the fifth largest school district in the country, I am aware of an elementary school that I think Rex had partnered with. And I think they started kind of as a pilot the excitement in with the students and the staff in that classroom i think the whole school got engaged and just started with a few classrooms so i do think once folks find out what's available and especially you know the energy that comes from the young people but i also appreciate you know that 
teachers, which, you know, are so amazing and so, uh, so able to just kind of adapt and, and really try to connect their students to what, you know, learning isn't just out of a book and, and just doing a worksheet or something that getting engaged and having it be something that students can get excited about. Boy, at the elementary level, it's just really taken off. And, and you know, I just think about my former district in that elementary school, I think is a great example of what's possible. Yeah. I, and I think, well, you know, also that combination of high level of student engagement, but without a lot of teacher lift, because, you know, teachers are at a lot of capacity nowadays. So being able to almost have a plug and play kind of solution like Rex is good for that. Um, I do want to pivot on our last question, because I think we, you know, Rex covers artificial intelligence, actually, they have a course on it um, in high school. Uh, so I got to ask the question, because we're all, you know, and I know you talk with superintendents, like I said, you do work with IEI. Uh, I know that they have uh, Doug's group. They do lots of meetings kind of regionally and kind of throughout the country. So I know the last couple, you probably had this come up a bit. What's the, th what's the word on the street? What's the feeling amongst leadership out there about AI, generative AI like ChatGPT and tools like that? Yeah, I, I think a AI is a real buzzword. I know at the AA AASA, the National Superintendents Conference that was held in San Antonio last year, boy, there was a lot of sessions and the buzz around AI was just off the charts. So I think educators like the rest of the country is trying to get their arms around it. And what we hope is that educators does not, do not make the same mistakes that we kind of made when cell phone technology and came in and, you know, let's just ban it. Let's just say yeah. kids can't use it. They can't have access to it. I think we've learned and we've become a lot smarter since then. So I think folks are trying to figure out how they start to bring AI into the classroom. I think IEI and superintendents getting together and having conversations about what works. And, you know, what I always love about public education is if someone figures out a way to do it better, faster, cheaper, you know, they share it, you know, and, and yeah. sometimes in private industry, oh no, we keep a lid yeah. on that, you know, and we're going to see how we can profit from that. But in education, if folks figure it out, they share it. They go to conferences, they do presentations on it, you know, they get round tables together and discuss it. And I think that's kind of what's happening with AI. I think we're just in the genesis and just trying to figure out as, you know, I know Congress was having a session about how do they regulate it and what does that look like? And even some of the founders and producers of AI are saying, we think it needs to have some parameters around it because it's you know, right now we don't even, I don't think we can even vast the capabilities of what potentially is out there. But I'm just glad that educators are saying, let's, let's think about how we listen to our young people, make this available and figure out how it might fit into schools. I still think we've got a lot of work to do, but I'm glad that oh, yeah. at least we're not just saying it's banned. Right. Maybe we did. Maybe we learned from that pass, that cell phone pass that you mentioned. And I, you're right. I've seen the up the, the original, in, you know, uptick was fear and banning. And then there's a little bit of a hype cycle that we always see with everything that's new that comes out. Uh, and then eventually it kind of levels off. And we say, all right, now let's see how we can use it. But I love that you said that, you know, that the freedom of sharing the democratization, I guess, of information that we like to do in education. So powerful, uh, especially now with this new tool. And you're right, the summer's coming. Uh, we're recording this in May. Uh, all sorts of sessions I'm already seeing. I'm doing a couple myself. And, you know, I'm even asked to do a keynote at a superintendent event in Indiana oh, nice. in October about, about AI. And I'm like, okay, well, I better build, you know, I'm not going to let AI build the keynote for me, but <laughs> I might include some of AI in my keynote. Um, so let me, let me wrap up by asking Dwight, uh, where can people find out more about you and the great work that you're doing? I know you do some work with IEI. If someone want to reach out and just ask you questions, wh where's a good place for them to find you? Yeah, I, um, you know, I, I am still around and, and still really having a lot of engaging conversations and still learning. You know, I, I still appreciate that there's still so much learning to be done. The best way to reach me is just by email. I just have a, a Gmail account. It's Dwight Jones 567 at gmail.com. That's always the best way. Or they can find me on LinkedIn. Uh, All right. And, you know, even though remember this old guy that is not very technical, you know, I'm learning and, and finding that LinkedIn and, and spots like that, um, you know, a lot of people interact that way. So that'd be a great place that people could find me. 
Well, you say you're not that technical, but you were able to troubleshoot getting on the podcast with me today. Uh, so, and I like that you use that phrase, always learning. And I think that's the most important thing. Leaders out there listening to this podcast right now, you don't have to be the techiest person in the room. There are lots of students that can buzz circles around all of us. Um, it's just about, like you said, that learning, that growth mindset. I think that's so important. So uh, thank you for being a part of Let's Talk, Let's Talk Computer Science podcast, Dwight. It's a pleasure. Thanks for having me, Carl. And of course, thanks to our friends at Rex Academy for making this podcast possible. You heard a lot from Dwight and myself talking a little bit about their platform and how it's actually seen in action in schools today. Be sure to check out their platform at rex.academy. We all know that technology will be the part of our future. And as educators and leaders, it's our role to make sure that all, and I mean all of our students, have an opportunity to that future as well. This is Carl Hooker signing off.